Welcome to Hook Girls Theory. It's Ash. And I'm Indy, and this is a podcast where we explore the world from the theoretical perspective of two hot girls. I wanted to bring up a article about Halsey, but also I wanted to combine it with an article about Megan Fox. And so let's just get into it. So this article comes from the Los Angeles Times by Christy Carras. Uh, And this is written on the 8th of July, 2021, and it is titled Halsey Fights the Stigma Around Pregnant and Postpartum Bodies with Regal Album Cover. Singer Halsey knows we have a long way to go with eradicating the social stigma around bodies and breastfeeding, but you can't blame her for trying. On Wednesday, Halsey revealed the cover of her upcoming fourth studio album, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power. The Game of Thrones-esque artwork shot by photographer Lucas Gradio sees the bad at love hitmaker seated in a golden throne balancing a baby on her knee whilst wearing a crown and floor-length gown exposing her left breast. In January, Halsey announced that they were pregnant with a colourful photo shoot alluding to the concept of a rainbow baby, a child born after the previous miscarriage. The Grammy nominee wrote this week on Instagram, it was very important to me that the cover art conveyed the sentiment of my journey over the past few months. The idea that me as a sexual being and my body as a vessel and gift to my child are two concepts that can coexist peacefully and powerfully. The closer artist is set to welcome her first child years after experiencing a miscarriage on stage during her concert in 2015. The incoming baby's father is Halsey's boyfriend, screenwriter Alev Aiden. My body has belonged to the world in many different ways the past few years, and this image is my means of reclaiming my autonomy and establishing my pride and strength as a life force for my human being. Halsey continued in their Instagram caption, the cover image celebrates pregnant and post bodies as something beautiful to be admired. I hope this can be a step in the right direction. In 2018, Halsey opened up about being diagnosed with endometriosis shortly before discovering she was pregnant on her 2018 tour. The next thing I knew, I was miscarrying on stage in the middle of my concert, she said. And the sensation of looking at 100 people, 100 couple teenagers in the face while you're bleeding through all of your clothes and still having to do the show. In that moment, I was like, I don't ever want to have to make that choice ever again. Doing what I love or not being able to be or not being able to because of this disease. So I put my foot down and I got really aggressive about seeking treatment and had surgery a year ago and I feel a lot better. Halsey's next studio album produced by Oscar-winning musical duo Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross arrives August 27th. That brings me to, let's just ignore the fact that this is coming from Yahoo because it's pretty much just paraphrasing from her in-style interview that she had recently. Fox opened up about parenting her three kids, Noah Shannon, eight and a half, Bodie Ransom, seven, and Journey River, four and a half, whom she shares with ex Brian Austin Green. Jennifer's body star teared up recounting how her sons had been the target of mean, awful people and cruel people online. I don't want him to ever read that shit because he hears it from the little kids at his own schools who are like, boys don't wear dresses. So for context, her son wears dresses and likes to wear dresses. And she's also been criticized for, you know, being at a Events for her upcoming films and not having her children with her and she's been vocal about saying you know you wouldn't ask their father this and why are you asking me because it's like I am able to have a life without my children she on, she goes on to say this whole year I've been very surprised by how archaic some of the mindsets are still in some people so essentially I just wanted to talk a bit about the Megan Fox situation with her children being Uh, I guess discriminated against for I guess trying to be more like gender fluid even as children and then also the way that she herself has been uh, critiqued for mothering her children and like you know being this person outside of a mother and then speaking on this article with Halsey which I think is really beautiful I obviously love Halsey and I think this is really revolutionizing in the way that we look at not only bodies and women's bodies, but also the concept of being a mother and motherhood. And I want to know your thoughts, Ash. When I saw the artwork for the Halsey thing, I was obsessed. And when when she posted all like the renaissance, like the different, like the same photo shoot, but different poses. And it was very like Virgin Mary-esque. Yes. I was like, stunning, stunning, stunning. And I'm so ready because Halsey gets me in the mood. And I know Indy is literally going to be... For that day that album comes out, you're, you're going to be ready. And then the Megan Fox one, real quickly. It's kind of funny to me because her ex-husband, I'm not, uh, uh, they're divorced, right? Yes. Or they're separated? They're divorced, divorced I yeah. believe. Or at least it's going through, but I think it's, di- it's, it's happening. So, like, this man is 
basically famous for like he had a few movies or like he did a few things and then he got like I was not vitiligo what's it called vertigo where like he can't (laughs) see properly very different things vertigo and um he would blame that on why he can't work anymore so Megan Fox had to be the breadwinner and I just find it funny that there's little to no criticism of that of him that he's like he was probably a good dad but he definitely was lazy he's shitty towards her now because she's obviously dating machine gun kelly which i have thoughts about but that's a whole different story <laughs> you and me both babe he has thoughts and he's like being really rude about her and all that but then he's the same guy who like he's been a public cheater and he also is like a Scott Disick in a way and only dates like really young 20 year olds. So I'm sorry, where's all the hate? I'm not saying there should be hate towards him, but why Why isn't there, why is there all the hate on Megan Fox, who we already know has got a lot of hate for literally just being beautiful, pretty in her power. And this guy just gets to be like, oh, he, you know, she left him for Machine Gun Kelly. And it's like, cause he was a deadbeat. That's not, even, that's deadbeat. not even true. Like she didn't leave him for Machine Gun Kelly. I don't think anyone would leave anyone for Machine Gun Kelly, but that's Literally. a totally different <laughs> thing in and of itself. Um, I think like for sure that Megan Fox has gotten a lot of shit, which is why I wanted to tie it in. And I didn't mean for it to be like this addition, like tacked on at the end because mostly just because all of this was really talked about in her in style interview which go look it up go have a read it's really long and I, we just we would have to dedicate a whole yeah, episode we'll to it day. yeah <laughs> so i think specifically with this whole idea that like she should be constantly taking care of her children is fucking bullshit and you know i think this ties into with the critique that halsey is making is that like she's saying like my body has belonged like has been belonging to everyone around me for so long i'm just very like i'm very excited for this album because ever since her first ep in 2015 it's always been conceptual so it's always been very big and out there and had story and depth to it but having this kind of relate more and more to her personal life of what she's going through now really means a lot to me Mm. and as ash said like it's very renaissance like the the visuals and she's always got great visuals for everything and it's this this era is like I think Manic was a bit of an album where it was like oh we're getting a bit more of a like raw emotive side of Halsey outside of like we had Badlands and then Hopeless Mountain Kingdom and now it's like we're getting back into that like I'm a powerful bad bitch and you can't tell me what to do even more so now that she's like I'm giving life and because she's always wanted to be a mom so it's like she's probably always been thinking about these critiques on like how to go about discussing her own autonomy and her own like desires for motherhood whilst also being like I'm still a person so what's going on with you Ash um before Melbourne I purchased the success experiment flex mammy's formula to knowing what you really want and how to get it now on hot girls one of our main inspos we've mentioned it like a thousand times now is bobo and flex absolutely and flex could literally tell me to jump off a bridge and i'll fucking do it <laughs> that's how much i look up to this woman like she would I, think you're fucking stupid whilst you do it but she would, right? she would yeah, be she, like she, oh, fucking she dumb could bitch. break it down like emotionally like why now why did you do that <laughs> it's like because you told me to but anyway um i'm getting to a point of my life again where I'm starting uni again and just making these really big changes to the projection of my life. I know that sounds really deep, but I feel like it is. And, you know, I'm getting towards the journey of who I want to be in the future, which I said is a successful leader of my own company who jets off around the world on the reg with a chihuahua in one hand and financial security in the other. (laughs) So basically Paris Hilton is what you want to do. You want to, you want to be Paris Hilton. But um, the book so far, I'm like less than a quarter of the way in is already making me rethink everything because yes i oh, i love it and it's like a book that you need a notebook for like you need to like write your notes and like write what you're feeling so that's why i'm only like less than a quarter way in because i really want to take the time yeah to like break down each chapter and how it can because i love reading like that but um it's just so much better because i have oh, there's that thing where like let's say like a white guy ceo like barefoot investor type vibes Ugh. like they'll literally just be like get some money, invest it, get some more money, invest it. But what I love about- Work hard, do this, do that, be a wage slave. But what I love about Flex is that she's literally like, what I do probably won't work for you, but this is how I'm going to, like, you're going to figure out 
how your skills can get you to where you want to be. Because my story, yeah, it can inspire you, but you, you can't do the same sets as me because everyone's different. And I love that. I fucking love that. And of course, instead of like saying how, you know, this is how we're going to get successful. She goes, why do you want success? What type of success are you chasing? And I just, I would rather that. So I'm excited to finish reading it. And at the end, I'll probably give an update. And I know Indy wants to read it. Yes, that's um, my my so, yeah. project for like, once I finish this year of uni and I'm like done with my degree and before I get stuck into the next phase of my learning, <gasps> that takes me to a place of much dis- dis- disdain and disgust within myself, but that's my own problem to deal with. I want to read this book too. I want to read lots of books. That's the problem. Um, so I don't, I don't have like any specific updates because my life, like I said, there's, it's either boring or there's lots of things going on that I can't, okay. that I can't talk about. <laughs> so I have a fun little anecdote today because I was at work and I was chatting with a coworker about, you know, the hoe phase and just like, I was talking because like a guy sent back into my DMs uh, recently and uh, I'm obviously cuffed right now. So I have been, you know, at this stage, I haven't quite taught him yet because like, I'm trying to shit stare a little bit, but you know, that's besides the point. Um, Anyway, so I was like talking about the fact that this guy's a Scorpio and she asked from there, she was like, oh, so do you know, have you had like one of each? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like one of each star sign. And she's like, how do you know the like majority of which people you've slept with have been which signs? And like, what's that? Now, I immediately knew that I hadn't, at least to my knowledge, had one of each star sign because I obviously don't gather people's astrology charts like as prerequisites to sex, but it definitely got me thinking about it because I definitely know that I attract fire signs a lot with my fiery energy of my fire moon. Not so much Leo's, but definitely Sagittarius's and Aries. And I honestly can't get away from them. Like it's, it's a problem. Then obviously the next was like, I'd had Scorpio, I guess was the next most common. And then a mix of like Virgo and Gemini. But obviously, like I said, I don't know everyone, which is, it just made me like want to know. And so obviously I was like, Ash, do you know what the dominant sign is that you've had throughout your Rolodex of dick? Lots of Pisces, Libras, Geminis. Ew. I know, right? Um, and Cancer. Gemini men and- also. Uh- and like Pisces men and any men, yeah, men, literally just men. It's it's been it's been mostly the problematic ones were always Libras and Pisces and Gemini's. But then there's one Cancer, and I'm currently with a Scorpio, but Scorpio is my sister sign, so that's fine. So if you love Hot Girls and you're looking to support the pod, there's many ways you can do this. You can follow us on social media, both Twitter and Instagram, to keep up to date with all what we're doing. This includes stories, posts, and of course, our new reels. We also post a lot of polls and questions on IG stories that actually do come up in the episode. So just hit us up at Hot Girls Theory on both. This is where you can also let us know what you think and give us feedback about the show and what you like to hear next. It's really up to you if you have a topic you're dying for us to talk about literally just dm us slide into the dms baby now you can find our personal igs mine's asha ashley so rose and indy is at fueled by indy and if you want to support the show you can donate to us via the buy me a coffee link on all our social platforms under the title support the show one off donations start at five dollars and memberships are currently in the works now a really great way you can help us out if you love the pod is by giving a positive review at apple podcasts Leave your Instagram handle and we'll read it on the show. So you can cute, you can do like a cute little message. Leaving us a positive review allows others to find us and for our show to grow. We want to hear from you. This means anything. If you need advice, if, an, if you have an idea for an episode, if you want to send us an article you think we may like, it's all up to you. Send us literally everything, anything, <laughs> if you want to at hotgirlstheory at gmail.com. This evening we have with us a young lady named Lisa. Hi everybody. Step step back up, stand back up, and try again. And you keep trying, you keep trying. And once you get your foot halfway in the door, that's the doorway. That's the opening. First thirty key to success. Uh, have they tried to, to mold you in any way though if people ask you to do things to change the way you look or speak or behave? Um, yeah, one of them tried to mold me into a big triangle shape and I went, no. Nah, you know, I've got my own style. 
I got my own style and I, I wrote my own songs and you know if someone has so much of something already there's very little you can add So it's that time again where we are looking at the Bad Bitches of History segment that we do on Hot Girls Theory. So this is something that we've come to. This is the fourth time. This is the fourth version of this. And we've done contemporary celebrities before, but we're taking it back to contemporary celebrities again because we wanted to look at pop idols and specifically pop idols with a tragic backstory and tragic death because what do we love? Tragedy. A tragic tragic story. (laughs) Exactly. We like the drama. We do. But also in a way of like, we want to honor these women. And I know for a fact that Ash has a very strong personal connection with her particular person that she's chosen today. And I also grew up listening to the person I chose without giving away, even though it's in the title and you know who it is already. I love her. So we want to honor these women and we want to do it in a way that shows you the good and the bad and the ugly. So before we get into this, this is just another disclaimer that this is not a full or comprehensive recounting of these events or either of these bad bitches lives in total. We don't claim to have or know all of the facts about these women. We simply wish to honor them both and share at least part of their stories with you. We also don't claim to know everything mentioned in the episode or that it's factual. Whilst we did our own research, we encourage you to do the same and do your own investigation. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Um, I guess my major question to you is, uh, you put out a song like Rehab, which again is a very honest statement for you, and uh, your, your life seems to be under a microscope. People tend to kind of check your sh- out or check your stuff out more than anyone else. Um, do you feel that it's a negative thing? Because I believe artists have always been themselves from the 60s and the 70s, but in, in the 80s and the 90s, 2000, people's lives are under a microscope. You can't just be an artist, but everyone's trying to get into your life all the time. How do you deal with that? Well, I don't know about you, Kevin, but it's important, I think, to just focus on the positive things. <laughs> I'm not a very negative person. I don't care to that. I mean, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, you, you can't, do you know what I mean? It's, um, it's all right. You can't focus on bad things. It's better not even to talk about it in a way. It's all right. It's all right. Do you know what I mean? Do you find yourself changing as far as um, before uh, hugely famous, and now it's it's no matter where you go, it's you're you're being watched all the time. Do you find yourself closing in, or are you still trying to maintain exactly who you are? Yeah. uh, Yeah. It's all right. Do you know what I mean? It's all right. The woman I'm about to speak about is a woman that I grew up idolizing. A lot of people who I talk about are people I idolize. (laughs) And I've always felt like I've been on this earth before this life. And this woman was an image of that to me. With the beehive hair and the crazy cat eyeliner with with this little frame riddled with tattoos and covered in leopard mini dresses. Like she was stunning to me. And she was stunning in a way that like not a lot of people when they talked about her would say how stunning she was. But I would always look at her and be like, that's why I want to be like I she was stunning to me. Aside from her aesthetic, her voice, I remember listening to from a very like young age, was something not from this time. It was like this 50s, 60s deep voice, but then she would sound so beautiful and sultry. And then she'd come out with these weird lines in like a jazz song being like, he kept his dick wet. And I was like, like the contrast of sounding so beautiful and then saying something so... It was very provocative. Now, if you haven't gathered, I'm talking about Amy Winehouse, an icon who was like indie has gone too soon. And just a warning, I'll get emotional probably towards the end because this was like the first celebrity death I remember crying about. Even if we Corey, Juliet is a cool person. I mean, she was the pink hat and so no, so well, basically, well, basically, oh, she's so popular. Oh, and she's about you. half a million boyfriends. She's so taking all this crap. Oh, I think, I think, I, 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 I hang on. Like, <laughs> Amy Jade Winehouse was born the 14th of September in 1983 to Jewish parents of very humble beginnings. The father, Mitch, who comes up a lot in the story, was a window paddle installer by day and a taxi driver by night. 
while her mother, Janice, was a pharmacist. Now, this woman lived by the beat of her own drum by a very early age. When she was a child, she was actually forced to go to the Jewish Sunday school because her ancestors were Russian and Polish Jewish immigrants. And she would beg her father for the permit not to go, stating it's not like she learned anything about being Jewish anyway. Now, she came from a family where most of her uncles were professional jazz musicians. Her father's mother was a singer and dated the famous English jazz saxophonist, (laughs) Ronnie Scott. Her parents would separate around this time. She was probably nine. And similar to me, she would stay with her mother mostly and see her father and his girlfriend on the weekends. In 1992, her grandmother pushed her to attend a theatre school on Saturdays to support her singing voice and also tap dance, which I never knew. And during her attendance for four years, she actually would found a rap group by the name Sweet and Sour with her best friend Juliet. And you'll see this with Amy. A lot of her songs have like Nas and Ghostface Killer. Like they have these like rap vocals, which like it's like it shouldn't work, but it does in a weird way, which I love. I think people forget about Amy is that she was quite young when her big career started. So at around 14, after playing her brother's guitar for ages, she began writing her own music and buying her own guitar to teach herself. Very soon, she would begin to work as an entertainment journalist and would sing for a local group called the Bolsha Band. In mid-2000, she became a featured vocalist for the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. Her best friend at the time, Tyler James, a soul singer, actually sent her demo to an A&R person who's like, from my understanding, is like an assistant to a record label that like they look after the artists. And she would sign to a pretty small management in 2002 and was paid £250 a week against future earnings, which I tried to look at what that meant. I don't know if she just got £250 or £250 was taken from her earnings. I'm not quite sure. As she was being developed in this management company, she was kept like almost secret despite her hunger to make her voice known, which basically means she wasn't getting promoted. Now that's when a man by the name of Darkest Beast would hear about her by accident. Him and a mate who was also a manager of someone else were going through like these productions of this other band. And Amy was a key vocalist on a chorus, I believe. Now Beast, who's an A&R rep for Island Records, which is pretty big company in a pretty big um recording label um he asked who's that woman and the man who was with who was a who was another manager said i legally am not allowed to say beast would then spend months and months and months trying to figure out who this deep soulful voice belonged to when he found her amy already recorded a number of songs and was signed with a publishing deal with emi as well as already forming a working relationship with a producer by the name of Salam Remy through this publishing deal. Beast would still go out of his way to introduce Amy to the head of Island Records, which then led her to get signed to Island and EMI and Virgin Records, the people who were chasing her, were already trying to begin and lure her into contracts. But this guy was literally like, nah, you've shelved her. She's coming with us. Now around this time, you have to remember it's like the early 2000s. A lot of like pop music shows and their stars were all over the radio. It was all that kind of Like, I love Britney, but it was all like that Britney music. And what Amy was producing was very, very different. And B saw Amy as the answer to a music audience who was starved for fresh and genuine young talent. Her debut album, Frank, was released late 2003 and it received critical claim. And people were amazed by this voice that stood alone from all the other pop acts at the time that were huge. And there's something about Amy, and you see this a lot said by people, that her voice and sound and her look shouldn't have been successful on paper but there was something about her that just she was different she was a breath of breath of fresh air there was just something about amy when i started writing the first song about blade the other songs just wrote themselves because i had these feelings i had these words floating around in me she would tell me stories about blake and this tempestuous, extreme relationship. He left no time to regret. Kept his dick away. Black. Oh, it's a bit upsetting at the end, isn't it? Oh, boom, boom, boom. now because we're about to talk about the back to black era and if you know this this is when i first found amy i'm pretty sure everyone my age 
the first time they kind of found Amy was through the soul rehab. And we can all know what I'm about to quickly downfall talking about. <laughs> so obviously Frank did well, the album. And as I said, we all grew up with Amy from the Back to Black era, which was that influence. She had that influence of the girl groups of like 1950s and 60s. She was very, it was a lot about men on that album and like getting over breakups. It was just amazing. Frank was her training album and Back to Back, Back to Black was like her home run. Celine Remy was still her producer, but Mark Rodson, who you probably know more now for like his work with like Miley Cyrus and people like that, joined the project. And this man, even though I have my thing about him, he does have a habit of touching something and it becomes gold. And with Amy, he can do the same thing. They dropped hits. So it dropped in 2006 and it was an international success, topping the charts in the UK and the US. As I said, I'm going to bring up Rehab, which was the first hit of the album. And we've all heard it. And I remember singing it. And my mum used to tell me off for seeing it because I think I would have been in year four or five when that song dropped. Like I was quite young, maybe nine or 10. I'm, I'm not sure how old I was then. I remember seeing it and my mom would look at me and be like, you don't even know what the words are about. I'm like, yeah, but it's scandalous. Cause like I was obsessed with, I remember at that age, I'd also always read famous and NW magazine, which are like trashy Australian tabloids. And I just, I love the idea of like celebrities gone bad. So writer Josh, and I think you say his last name is Ty Rangel, I think said it perfectly when he said, what she is, is mouthy, funny, sultry, and quite possibly crazy. It's impossible not to be seduced by her originality. Combine it with the production by Mark Rodson that references four decades worth of soul music without once ripping it off, and you've got the best song of 2007. The next singles that came off the album were You Know I'm No Good, which was actually remixed by the rap vocalist Ghostface Killer, which is a very good remix. Back to Black, which I have screamed in the shower so many times. Tears Dry My Own, literally, I'm pretty sure I put that on a breakup playlist through this um, <laughs> podcast. Love is a Losing Game and so much more. Um, it was when the deluxe edition came out and Valerie was on it. Amy Winehouse's rendition of Valerie, it's such a sad song, but how she sings it, it makes me happy for some reason. Like when, when you actually listen to the lyrics, it's kind of like sad it's a song you, that plays uh, on the yeah. work radio because it yeah. sounds like it that valerie like she's got that like tone to it where she's like singing it nicely not that i can sing so fuck that but like you know it's it's literally marketable because it's it sounds like a bop it sounds happy yeah. but like she's literally talking about like a lost lover and it's just amazing and so then she went on concerts and festivals and this is when i think we can all remember the photos from those festivals where she went from this very curvaceous woman to like rail thin and not healthy. Let's just say that. After he came back from America, married, that was the first time Amy tried crack cocaine and heroin. It completely eradicates any sort of negative feelings. And then Amy tried it with me and it just got a grip of both of us really quickly from then. Amy, come in here. Oh, change the record. Just come on. Half a minute. You can't say Amy Winehouse without thinking of what she became notorious for. In November 2007, the opening night of her 17th date tour, she was booed and audience would walk out. As critics stated from the Birmingham Mail, that it was one of the saddest nights of my life. I saw a supremely talented artist reduced to tears, stumbling around the stage and unforgivable, unforgivably swearing at the audience. Now, a lot of her concerts around this time would end similar to this and she'd be pretty intoxicated throughout their whole performance. Later that month, she announced that she would be cancelling all public appearances for the rest of the year as her doctor ordered her to rest, citing the rigours of touring and the emotional strain is what kind of pushed this to happen. She was beginning to be known as this very filthy mount diva and even titled by Newsweek as the perfect storm of sex kitten, raw talent and poor impulse control. Karen Heller of the Philadelphia Inquirer summarized Amy as she's only 24 with six Grammy nominations, crashing headfirst into success and despair with a codependent husband in jail, which I will fucking get into that man exhibitionist parents with questionable judgment and the paparazzi documenting her emotional and physical distress 
Meanwhile, a haut designer Karl Lagerfeld appropriates her disheveled style and eating issues to market to the elite while proclaiming her the new Bardo. It was around now 2008 where her drug problems really started to threaten her career as the head of Island Records thought it may be best if they released Amy Winehouse. Now, she was making millions and millions and millions at the time. So for him to do that, it was all because she was affecting their image. And it was pretty similar treatment that was seen in the newspaper commentary done by executive director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crimes, Antonia Maria Costa. And they said that the alleged drug habits of Winehouse and other celebrities set a bad message to others who were vulnerable to addiction and undermine the efforts of other celebrities trying to raise awareness of problems in Africa. Now that there's more cocaine used in Europe passes through that continent, which just quickly outside, I don't, I think that's a leap and a half to make personally to say, oh, Amy's struggling with all this addiction is affecting all these white savior celebrities in all these countries. It's kind of like two different things. Don't, don't use this as kind of your way of saying like fit finger pointing who's bad and who's not. It's I just, just like shifting the blame and like further putting more responsibility onto Amy and kind of making it being like, you should be a spokesperson because you're in the public eye and you should know better. Exactly. And to that, a spokesperson for Amy said, Amy has never given a quote about drugs or flaunted it in any way. She's had some problems and is trying to get better. The UN should get its own house in order, which I was like, yes. Now, I was too young to be at the drug taking stage, but it was clear that Amy had hearts of the younger generation who were dealing with substance abuse because they didn't only say Amy is this drugged up diva, but they saw Amy as just a girl who was just fucking going through it. And Lily Allen, who I love, she said, I know Amy Winehouse very well, and she's very different to what people portray her as being. Yes, she does get out of her mind on drugs sometimes, but she's also a very clever, intelligent, witty, and funny person who can hold it together. You just don't see that side. And the Grammy goes to Amy Winehouse. To Mark Ronson and Salam Remy, to my mum and dad. For my Blake, my Blake incarcerated. And for London, this is for London, because Camden Town ain't burning down. A good note I want to say around this period is that in 2008, she won five Grammy Awards, which is huge. And this further skyrocketed the album again. Back to Black just kept going up and up and up for years and years after it got released and there's this video I'm not sure where if India's seen it but Tony Bennett announces that she won record of the year with rehab and they're doing it through a broadcast because sadly she couldn't be in the U.S. because she failed a drug test you see Amy like she because obviously it's on delay so Tony Bennett says it there's a five second pause so obviously she's hearing it and you just see her like this hard exterior just drops and you see just this childlike look on her face. Like, oh my God, I did something. I did something. I did something. She kind of like falls into her jazz band almost like this lit. Cause she was quite tiny at this point. She like falls into the jazz band and the jazz band are so happy for her. And she kisses her mom. And it's just, it's the Amy that I think a lot of people didn't want to see just a girl who just wanted to be praised for doing something that wasn't the norm at the time, which is making jazz pop fusion music what was really annoying about that is that natalie cole who stood beside tony bennett who has had her drug issues her alongside a lot of other critics slammed the grammys for giving her an award saying she has substance abuse issues she shouldn't be allowed to have it what you you, you just what you just want her to be on the ground all day like you just want to like you don't want to give the her the recognition that? she deserves for creating all of this really beautiful art probably not only just in spite of but also because of her drug problems it's people who've been through what the other person has been through and then because they've recovered they get on this pedestal almost and i will never get that like have some compassion like, respectively shut the fuck up and for London, this is for London. Get those awards like that. It just made all the work seem worthwhile. I was just hysterically crying. I was so overwhelmed. I was so proud of her. And I was just flashing our whole life, our childhood. And then she saw me crying, grabbed me, pulled me up on stage and took me off the stage. And I was like having a bit of a panic attack. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. This is amazing. I'm so proud of you. And I'm looking at her trying to get some form of reaction. She went, Jules, this is so boring about drugs. 
Now, this is where I have to put a really big trigger warning. I'm about to talk about more substance abuse, cutting, suicide, eating disorders. I'm basically going to talk about what really happened behind the scenes and what inspired a lot of the drug usage. Her issues really began in 2005. She went through a big period of heavy drinking and heavy drug use. As the hair got bigger and bigger, she would get smaller and smaller and smaller. And her substance abuse issues overshadowed her apparent and self-admitted eating disorder issues. Around the time of 2006, her grandmother died. Now, this woman was like her top influencer in looks and music. When she cancelled a number of shows in the following year in 2007, she was hospitalized for an overdose of heroin, XC, cocaine, ketamine, and alcohol. I either say it, but this cocktail only screams that this woman was fucking hurting. Because usually you only hear, oh, an overdose on one or two things. Yeah. This was a very extreme amount of drugs combined with alcohol. Like it's it's not just it's not just like this person overdosed because they were taking drugs. It's like this person wanted to harm themselves fatally. <sighs> it's just hard. And her own father said it was probably the only thing that got through to her at that point to at least admit she had an issue and admit that her grandmother's death had like had set off an addiction factor with her. So yeah, in 2008, she had a lot of erotic behavior. There was lots of allegations of assault. I don't have, I don't have time to bring that up. So just Google it. But a lot of those type of things, her family were like, shit, we don't think rehab's working. And Mitch, her father, and who was now her manager at this point, sought to have her detained under the Mental Health Act because everyone was like, we, like, because I think the running joke with Amy before her death was like, how the fuck is this girl still alive? Mm. Like, she's tiny. She's doing all these drugs. How is she alive? Sentiment of that time where it's like, um, where it's like uh, when you're in love and uh, I don't care if you don't love me. I will lie down in the road, pull my heart out and show it to you. Do you know what I mean? You know, I love all that, uh, I love all that kind of drama. And Amy sadly falls into the tail of that she'd probably still be alive if it wasn't for a fucking man. Because men are the worst. <laughs> the man guy goes by the name of Blake Felder Sybil, otherwise known as Leech, but hey, that's just my fucking bias. But there was also a boyfriend before this called Alex, and he was a leech too because he sold a story about their relationship with Amy to News of the World, which is a disgusting paper, and thank God it's not a paper anymore. And it was published under the headline, Bondage Crazed Amy Just Can't Beehive in Bed. That's a journalistic piece, really. And like, like a play on the word behave. It's just, it's just like annoying. Like, how is that? Ugh, it's just annoying. People who, anyway. People who study journalism to become that kind of journalist, mm. sh- literally there's a special place in hell for you. Blake was a former video production assistant. And I think he was a musician before he met Amy, but like safe to say he was a deadbeat. Um, and it's, yeah, he was a bum. But him and Amy got married on the 18th of May in 2007 and... The next month, Amy admitted in the interview that it was a very violent relationship, saying, if he says one thing I don't like, I'll chin him. He he said very similar things, but obviously because it's Amy, she's the one in the public eye. There's a lot more quotes that she said publicly. A few months after, they were paparazzi'd covered in blood and bruises after an alleged fight, but she said it was self-inflicted. Now, I think we've all heard that tale before of, oh, where's that bruise come from? Oh, like I fell down the stairs. So you can kind of put the pieces together with how bad this relationship was. Now, both parents of the two were highly concerned that they were going to commit suicide with how toxic this relationship became. Blake's father encouraged the public to boycott Amy's music and Mitch, Amy's father, was angered by this because you have to remember, Amy loves her mother, but she's a daddy's girl. She even has daddy's girl tattooed on her arm. What Blake's father didn't really include in this little hatred for Amy is that Blake was the one that introduced her to a lot of the really hard drugs that did their thing with her. And he also taught Amy, now this is trigger warning, this gets a bit gross, but would push Amy to do what he did to aid with the withdrawal symptoms and was that to cut himself, kind of to cut the pain in a way. The paparazzi would also publish Amy's cuts, which is beyond evil to me, beyond... Like money is great, but how can you sit at night in bed thinking you've sold pictures of this? Like I, it's disgusting to me, but this led to, in 2009, paparazzi were banned to be within 100 meters of a London home to follow her or photograph her in other people's house. Now, Blake would be in and out of jail throughout the whole marriage. And it was mostly being violent towards other people. And what was fucked about this is that 
he would use Amy's money a lot in these to pay people off. And Mitch always had to go in her dad and be like, Amy's not involved. He's just using her money. Now, this relationship with Blake was very on and off, on and off. And they were divorced in 2009. When she moved on with this other guy called Josh Bowman, who was this actor, she would say she was in love again and she didn't need the drugs, implying that the whole marriage to Blake was just based on drugs and like the bad bitch she was. This was a bit before, like before the divorce papers were sent to her. She was questioned, oh, why are you with another man? And she said, oh, for the time being, I forgot I was even married. Now, shortly after this, the divorce papers were handed to Amy, stating adultery was the reason for the marriage ending. And you can just kind of tell the depths of this relationship because a few months later, after receiving the papers, Amy said, I still love Blake. I want him to move into my new house with me. That was my plan all along. I won't let him divorce me. He's the male version of me and we're perfect for each other. But nonetheless, the the divorce was granted. It was uncontested and Blake got no money. Thank God. In 2008, reports became rampant about Amy and her health, especially the fact that she had emphysema, which actually was a misstatement from her father. And it was corrected that she had the early stage signs of it, which is not any better, but... It's not as serious, I guess, as having it. But her father also said that her lungs were working at 70% capacity as she dealt with an irregular heartbeat, which was just years and years of chain smoking, crack cocaine, just catching up with her. And despite doctors saying that if she continued to do it, she would have to wear an oxygen mask and she would eventually die, she kept doing it because... She just wasn't mentally well. This woman put her body through the fucking ringer. In the same year, she would say she was eating loads and loads of healthy food, sleeping loads, playing the guitar, making music, writing letters to her husband, who was Blake at the time, to feel better. She also loved a good tanning bed and even had one in her flat that she would regularly use. Now, I'm not sure if everyone remembered, but a few days before her death, um, I, I still remember this. I was sitting at the table and the news was reporting of how fucked up she was at this I think it was like in Berlin it was like it's it's this random European country and for a long time she was okay like she gained weight again like you didn't really hear about her which is kind of a good thing about Amy if you didn't hear about her that meant she was being healthy these videos came out of her in Berlin and she was skinny and she had like her hair was just everywhere and it was her makeup was running she was stumbling she couldn't even sing and there's a really famous photo of her hugging herself with again this childlike type face and it's almost like she knew that like it was coming yeah like something was going to happen very soon i definitely remember this as well we're going to turn now to a major loss in the music world tonight the gifted singer amy winehouse found dead in her london home she was just 27 and so many people blogging and tweeting throughout the day today about an almost eerie coincidence so many young music stars lost and so many lost when they too were 27. But with the spectacular highs came desperate lows. And tonight she adds her name to a tragic list of rock legends, all dead at 27. And like so many, she shared their destructive addiction to drink and drugs. She spent as much time in police stations as she did on stage. On the 23rd of July, 2011, her bodyguard, who was frequently checking in on her as she was starting to drink again, obviously, came to her house. He saw her lying on her bed and when he tried to wake her, there was no response, but he wasn't that worried because she was a deep sleeper and she was known to sleep in late and it was only 10 a.m. Now, he checked on her again at 3 p.m. She was in the same position, but he felt no pulse. He quickly called emergency services. Two ambos were rushed to the scene, but she was pronounced dead. As soon as the police confirmed and announced her tragic death, media, crowds were everywhere, camera crews are everywhere, fans were at her gate whilst forensic investigators rushed to the flat to start cornering off the property from the public and figure out why did she die. They found, and I remember this being everywhere, they found two big vodka bottles and they deemed that that's probably what killed her. And the official verdict at that time was misadventure and it was reviewed that she was five times over the legal drive limit. But um, her brother taught on her eating disorder being probably the killer when it was looked over again in 2012 he said she she suffered from bulimia very badly that's not like a revelation you knew just by looking at her she would have died eventually the way she was going but what really killed her was the bulimia i think that it left her weaker and more susceptible had she not had an eating disorder she'd probably been physically stronger in the end she'd probably still be here if she was physically stronger and actually eating properly and not 
doing what she was doing. And I think since her death, I definitely remember there was a lot of judgment at the time about how she died and being, oh, it's Amy Winehouse and like play on her name. But I think as our generation got older, I think there's been a lot of more care about her situation because we were the ones growing up with seeing her and then seeing her death. So yeah, I don't know. Any final thoughts, Indy? Well, I think to kind of close it off, similar with what I'm about to talk about and similar with our Anna Nicole and Brittany Murphy episode, we kind of see this pattern again and again of like the media really creating just like an Animal Farm-esque kind of show where like you know you you talked about it repeatedly like the the tabloids and the media trying anything they could to get scandalous information about her which made her just this show she was in a zoo she she was our entertainment and she wasn't ever this real fully formed human being that's what makes it so easy for so many people at the time to be like all it was was a drug addicted like drug fucked anorexic bitch who deserved to die and I remember that being definitely a general consensus at the time and I think as well like I want to touch on quickly my mom like I remember my mom loves Amy Winehouse Mm. like she because obviously that was around the time you know we were like 10 years old my mom would have been give me one moment um my mom was in her 30s you know she was like that age where like I guess like she wasn't supposed to relate to this child like pop star but like she did because my mom was also had the drug fucked moments the 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 eating disorders she's had this all these experiences and I remember like her dying like really definitely affected my mom and like the the love my mom has for her has definitely come from a place of like wanting to also protect her because she knows what it's like to be in that position. And I think that's how it always is when you're a young woman who has drug problems or has any kinds of problems like this, you're deemed crazy. No one else wants to take a second look at you. There's no way you can get help because no one's willing to give you help because they're like, help yourself. You've got money, help yourself. No, I just think the most unfortunate thing about it all is the way that the media spins things like, oh, who we can learn from Amy's death is... I don't feel that, you know, Amy needed to learn any lessons. I felt that the lesson was for the world to be kinder to the superstar. You know, everybody was so hard on her, and um, everything that I knew about her was that she was the most lovely and nice and kind woman. So A lot of people blamed her for her addiction, yes. right. which is stupid because addictions are serious issues, and it's diseased. It's it is. So we all know TLC is iconic. We all love them, whether that's a surface level love like bops for waterfalls and no scrubs. Both iconic for karaoke in my opinion. But who is behind the iconic R&B trio? Today, I'll be doing a deep dive into one third of the girl group, Lisa Left Eye Lopez. Lisa Nicole Lopez was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 27th, 1971 so she's a gemini she is a daughter of a seamstress and a u.s army sergeant she had a younger brother and sister her father was an authoritarian who was known to be very strict and domineering throughout her childhood and would treat the family like they were in a boot camp aka he ran things like he did in the army and he had incredibly high standards for his wife and his children he was also a musician but simultaneously an alcoholic and was at times physically abusive towards lisa he even beat her mother in front of her and her siblings things. Lisa's father would give her alcohol and encourage her to participate in underage drinking. It became a running joke among her family about how much alcohol she was able to consume or, you know, that quote of like how much she could Mm. put away. And this was when she was about 15 years old. All of this Lisa disclosed in the documentary, The Last Days of Lisa Left Eye Lopez, where she recalled a way in which her father would be proud of her ability to drink 15 or more beers. Fuck, I can't even drink like over four. Her home life got progressively more and more abusive. And by the time she was in her late teens, she had run away from home. At the time, she moved in with her grandmother shortly after. Not that this was a much better situation since Grandma Lopez also had her downfalls and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as we know. Through all this, she had some serious daddy issues and was constantly trying to impress him and win his love through her talents. It's speculated that this is why she was motivated to become a performer and an R&B star. You know, she was trying to get the attention of her negligent father. But as the end of the day what seemed to make him happiest was sadly her alcoholism and her ability to drink in 
In 1990, when Lisa was 21, she moved to Atlanta with nothing but $750 and an electric piano for an audition for a female girl group, which was originally titled Second Nature, and this would then go on to become TLC. This is when Lisa went on to become an American rapper, singer, songwriter, record producer, and dancer. She was alongside Tioni Watkins, T-Boz, and Rosonda Chili Thomas. Lopez was renamed Left Eye after a compliment from new edition member Michael Bibbins, who once told her that he was attracted to her because of her left eye, which was more slanted than her right eye. Lopez emphasized her nickname by wearing a pair of glasses with the right lens covered by a condom in keeping with the group's support for safe sex, wearing a black stripe under her left eye and eventually getting her left eyebrow pierced. TLC hit the charts in 1992 with an album which had four single hits, Ooh, on the TLC tip, which sold 6 million copies worldwide, which is a pretty fucking stellar yeah. debut album. Let's be real, especially for the time. It's like the 90s as well, yeah. On the tea, 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 tea I'm the leggy, leggy, left eye. I'm the skinny, be the cheers, chillay. And that is ooh, on the TLC tip. For the 90s, where the, I guess like at the same time though, there was no girl groups like this. So this was really, mm. again, filling that void. So however, the success for Lisa was unfortunately tainted by the death of her father. In the early days of being signed to the label with the group, she found out that her father had been victim of gun violence. He was killed in a drunken argument where guns were involved and it was fatal. But you know, Lisa was on the up and up and she had this urge and this opportunity and she wasn't going to let the death of her father come between her and this opportunity. To just look contextually, at the time of hip hop and R&B in the 90s, there weren't a lot of female rappers like I mentioned. And you know, you think we have Slim Pickens now. Well, imagine 30 years ago. There it was, was very masculine. And <laughs> there was like Little Kim and that's Yes. <laughs> and the culture was literally just for men. Like it was only kind of that, 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 that ecosphere of yeah. rap at the time was literally just men and men groups. And so you have these three young black women being sexy and fun and singing and rapping about sex and encouraging safe sex. This is really breaking down those barriers that kept women out of rap music for so long. Is it like what you thought? This fame life? A little bit. Um, mm-hmm. It was a dream for, I know, all three of us, but it has a lot to do with politics, um, money, uh, this person, that person, who's bigger. It's 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 not everything. Yeah, that, you know, it's not a bowl of peaches be. and cream. Like, it's it's not? a lot of hard work. Yeah. A lot of hard work. Lisa was a driving force behind the group as well. She received more co-writing credits than any of the other two members and contributed to the group's image through album titles, artworks, and often even designed outfits and staging for the group's live performances or music videos. We're at a time in her life where TLC is not only an instant hit globally, but they're keeping up that momentum despite her father's death. She's making lots of money, but never really taking any time to let herself grieve, especially considering her relationship with her father, which was pretty abusive and and he was neglectful but in a lot of ways this became her motivation for success and I think it was honestly a coping mechanism for her like if she avoided the reality of his death then she avoided the reality that all she had to keep her going was her own drive for herself it's an easy equation the death and grief plus stardom and money equals her drinking and alcoholism getting worse meanwhile her persona the facade she turned on for the world to see was only just getting started and she was becoming more audacious and giving you more and more of that lisa left eye lopez attitude alcoholism was truly just starting to take over her life the way she described every time she would get drunk her personality would change this was every single time she was inebriated and it split her into an alter ego so much like her pop star self did too there was this other side of lisa which she named nikki this was because she truly became someone else to the point where she had no control anymore, not over her actions, her words, or her body. Then there was this other half and this other self to Lisa that she describes as being necessary to calm this destructive and damaging Nikki. And this was known as Nina, which you may know as one of her later solo songs, like solo albums, sorry. So there was really this profound decentralization of Lisa Lopez at the time. To Lisa Left Eye Lopez, to Nikki, to Nina, she was never ever truly herself. And I think that this started to really be what broke her down as a person. 
He was very romantic and he was my best friend. But there were some parts about it that weren't that good. So let's talk about some of her relationships now because she was in a famously tumultuous relationship with the Atlanta Falcons football player, Andre Ryson, who they began dating sort of after the release of the first album. And this was, as I said, iconic and toxic and heated. And it was a a very bad relationship. And it wasn't long before the two moved in together in Ryson's home, which was then where that toxicity turned more violent. Man, there were so many problems in our relationship. Now, Lisa had filed an assault charge against the football player, 2nd of September, 1993. He denied ever beating her at the time, and it was said that Andre was very controlling and abusive and restricting of her freedom. Andre Risen had just left this night spot with his girlfriend, rap singer Lisa Lopez, and allegedly started beating her. My mother and my father fought a lot, and, you know, I, I just react quickly to those kind of situations. So when Andre's grabbing on me and stuff, they turn into fight. It was very jealous and very possessive. I didn't have any freedom. That's a big problem. Freedom. Anything. Ask first. I needed permission to do things. She often needed daily permission to do just about anything. And of course, he was paranoid about her cheating with other men. But not even a year later, during a dispute in which Lisa had caught him cheating on her firsthand, like in bed with another woman kind of thing, she had taken his shoes that Andre had just bought himself and probably even like football shoes, something like that. I don't know. And she threw them into the bathtub and doused them with lighter fluid and then set it all on fire. Get it, bitch. Well, this was pretty... (laughs) This was pretty devastating because it wasn't just the shoes. Uh, This bathtub was actually made of fiberglass, so it melted and it caused the remainder of the house to catch fire. So this whole house burnt down. Throughout this whole situation, there was a lot of violence leading up to this final act of her setting everything on fire. Andre had actually beaten her and she had received a severe black eye and bruised lip and ribs, obviously not in a very good state at the time. Mm. And at this time, she had basically completely blacked out and dissociated. I don't know what he said, but he got slapped for it. He went in the house. I went in the house behind him. So it was just all building up, building up, building up. So now it's all coming out. It's all coming out. Everything that I just kept inside, all my frustrations, I was just enraged. I was about to snap. I was hurt. The whole time I'm screaming and he grabbed me, throwing me back on the bed, pinning me down. And uh, how, you know, how could you? And ripping my clothes and he's just going crazy. And then when I would get up on my feet and then I would start just beating on him and stuff, you know, he would ball up and he would just let me take my frustrations out. And I was blasted, I was wasted. I was blacking in and out the whole time. And I woke up, and that's when I walked in the bathroom and looked in the damn mirror. And when I seen my face, I was like, I'm about to kill him. I had a big bruise right here (laughs) that went from the outside of my lip, flipped the lip under, to the inside. (laughs) Damn. I didn't even, almost didn't even recognize myself. I was like, no, no. And then you wake up to fight. No, this is not happening. (laughs) I'm going to kill him. I was still enraged. I was still hurt. And there was a lot of other stuff going on that night. Like I said, it was very violent, very toxic. So please go do further research if you'd like to know about what happened. But later, after she went to the hospital to receive treatment, she was arrested and charged with first degree arson. And she received a five year probation sentence and a 10K fine. Her relationship with Ryson would later be reconciled and they would have an on again, off again kind of relationship for the next seven years, including marriage. They did get married. Rapper Lisa Left Eye Lopez was sentenced yesterday for burning down her boyfriend's million dollar mansion. But she and Atlanta Falcon uh, football star Andre Ryson still plan to marry. Now, simultaneous to this relationship with Andre, Lisa famously had an ongoing flirtatious relationship with Tupac. Now, whilst this relationship wasn't sexual in nature, it was quite emotional and it had like an emotional connection to it. 
you know, they were talking on the phone all the time and there was definitely a lot of jealousy when the others were in proper real romantic relationships. And there was something about this dynamic that never really reached its full like suspected potential, if you know what I mean, because there was a lot of mutual respect between these two artists and clearly a lot of feelings and love. But I think it goes back to that whole thing of like, Lisa was a bit too good to have ever made it to be in a relationship with Tupac. Like she was too on his level, not only yeah. intellectually, but also musically. He seems to find himself and like, there's things about Tupac that I think a lot of people forget funny enough, but because he's dead. That's why. <laughs> yeah. That's why. And like, he did the same thing with um Jada Pickett Smith. Yeah. Like he has these deep, emotional connecting relationships with these women that at least with Jada Pickett Smith we know the after effects of because it's kind of weird that she talks about it in a way that Willow Smith is like he's like my dad and then Will Smith is like oh well I'm getting a dad but like I don't know it's in- it's always been interesting to me how Tupac does that and has that effect like he was a charmer and yeah he was hot but like it's strange to me that he was so emotional with these women but they were never girlfriends Ever. After Tupac died, Lisa was asked in an interview if he proposed, would she marry him? And she said yes, she would have married him. So that kind of goes to show the kind of relationship they had, yeah. I suppose. And this was like literally while she was with Andre. So was a very, very strong person. I've been through a lot of things. It's very similar to what he has been through, but he's been through that much more and he's accomplished so much more than I have so I can kind of relate to you know him in a sense of uh, being strong and still pushing on and moving forward and trying to follow up with his mission whatever it may have been so now after everything that went down literally with Andre and his house and the abuse that Lisa suffered Lisa went to rehab for her alcoholism this was I believe it was sentenced by the court as well. Now, the, at the time, the widespread opinion of Lisa is that she's crazy. She's psycho. She's destructive. And that... Of course she is. Yeah. And this was in part because Andre had been able to make all of these excuses and justify his violence as an appropriate response for her be- to her behavior. Like, oh, I just slapped her to calm her down. And she burned my house down to deflect any attention away from his part in her downfall. This made the attention surrounding her crazy persona and the way she was actually crazy as opposed to her stage persona was something that she had no control over no matter how much she tried to regain herself throughout her life and career she would always be crazy left eye so this is a quote said by lisa to vibe magazine at the time the hardest thing about being in tlc is accepting the fact that i'm left eye i try to go out and be lisa do what lisa would have done three four years ago and it just don't work i have to act a certain way and according to what people expect so during her rehab Lisa was permitted to leave to record for TLC's second album, Crazy Sexy Cool. Lisa, of course, being the crazy. This album was released in November of 94 and it sold 23 million copies worldwide. It earned them Grammys and it was a huge album. This is where we had No Scrubs and Waterfalls and everyone knows this album. Everyone loves this album. However, because Lisa was in rehab at the time and whilst it was in every stage of production, it meant that she had limited input in writing and recording, which obviously was a huge change from their first album. This is most likely what led her to not feeling as though she could fully express herself when she was a part of TLC because there was a lot of manufacturing going on to make money for all those in Involved and less about the art and the music and telling the story of who you are and being in charge of your own image, which is what Lisa wanted the whole time. Despite the success of the album and the previous album and the amount of record sales, TLC at the time was broke. They were completely broke and had no money. They announced bankruptcy and for the public, it was like, well, where did all that money go? But for the group, it was more of a matter of negligent contracts and money owed to record companies. That money from the record sales wasn't going to these women directly, but to the people involved who were using them for their own gain. And this is primarily why there wasn't any album again until 1999 when they released Fan Mail, which was another momentous album for them, especially given the time between Fan Mail and Crazy Sexy Cool. Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Can you come up to the mic? I've got two questions for you. 10 million albums. How can you be broke? And two... What's coming up with Left Eye Productions? Well, first of all, 10 million albums and how can we be broke? Um, it's kind of, 
I, I can't go into everything right now, but trust me, you can sell 10 million albums and be broke if you have greedy people behind you. So because through all of this, Lisa feels as though she isn't able to authentically represent herself in the music that TLC is creating and how she's being represented in interviews at the time, she talks of doing a solo album and she's vocal in interviews about not feeling comfortable with her image or the way she's betrayed. At one stage, she says, I've graduated from this era. I cannot stand 100% behind this TLC project and the music that it's supposed to represent me. This will be my last interview until I can speak freely about the truth and present myself on a solo project but because this is seen as a flip-flopping kind of act from Lisa and it's kind of going from one extreme of promoting TLC and then saying this is not what I want it's not super well received because everyone is like what the fuck is going on when TLC first started we were happy um, shortly after that, we had managerial problems. Then I had my legal problems and things didn't seem to be quite so fun anymore. And um, there were times when we fought like sisters. I'm not a wild person, but if you're gonna compare me to the other two group members, you know, I have probably had the wildest um, statements. I have done a a wild thing when, when Andre and I got into the house situation and the house burnt down, you know, and I think people saw that as like outlandish, like, oh, she's, you know. <laughs> Through all of this, there's a lot of complicated things with the media covering what's happening at the time, but at the crux of it, Lisa was basically avoiding her responsibilities to the group. She was spending all of her time in Honduras because she became enthralled with this doctor slash guru who brought her to Honduras in 1997. And he's this very new age man who's very much into all these cleanses and fasting, which he's put Lisa on to. Also, despite claiming to be a doctor and knowing the cure to AIDS, he literally oh, had God. never been to medical school and never became qualified. He's that kind of doctor. Oh, I was rooting for him. I was like, oh yeah, get her back. And then, oh. It okay. kind of did seem like at the time it was working though. Like it was doing yeah. her good to believe in this and I don't think that this doctor didn't necessarily have a kind of big role in her death I wouldn't say but he definitely okay. had a big role in her like what in the events that led to her dying at the time she was building camps for children in Honduras and no one really knows like what that meant or where she was but she was just kind of doing her own thing for a while in the year 2000 Lisa was reported missing when she didn't show up to a family gathering and a press conference for TLC and people are like babe where are you what's going on this is because she had driven to Honduras with her boyfriend because she was like, fuck it, I'm not doing any of this. And she just left. This only further cements her reputation in the media as being not only crazy, but unstable and unpredictable. By 02, she's back in Honduras for a family retreat. She spends the entire time filming the trip because she's on another quote cleanse. And this is going to help her document that she's not what everyone thinks she is that she's really changed so she's really trying to promote this i'm a new lisa left eye lopez i'm not left eye anymore i'm just lisa lopez this is my music this is what i'm gonna do she's really trying to rebrand herself through this like look at what i've done look at the journey i've taken it's not frustrating at all for me to get the type of attention that i get when the house situation happened when the media wrote certain things about me and I was labeled as being crazy. At the end of the day, I did notice that it actually did help sell records. This is where the tragedy comes and takes all of that away from her. Because after this cleanse, everyone's in the car driving back, Lisa is in the passenger seat and they hit a 10 year old Honduran boy with a car. They're all trying to resuscitate him. They rush him to the hospital, but sadly he dies. So this was a very pivotal, tragic moment for Lisa. In her personal life, she was very maternal. And this is something that was quite ignored by the media because she'd actually at this point had adopted two children. She had adopted an eight year old girl and a 12 year old boy. I never knew that. Oh my god. One of the, I, th I believe the 12 year old boy that she adopted, or it was the girl, I couldn't remember specifically, but one of them was the child of someone she met when she was in rehab as well. And this, like the her adopting these children wasn't even revealed until the last days of Left Eye documentary. So she's grief stricken by the death and this little uh, of this little boy and she's feeling somewhat responsible despite authorities and the boy's family agreeing that it was an unforeseeable tragedy you know she pays for the medical bill and she pays for the funeral 
but she says that she won't ever be able to get over it. In the documentary, which was finally released in 2007, Lisa describes being able to see her own death in a premonition type of way. And she feels a presence of a dark spirit that is following her and that this spirit was responsible for the death of the child because he mistakenly took his life instead of hers because they also had similar names. He was Lopez with a Z and she's Lopez with an S. So she's making all these connections and she's feeling really shit, but she's also seeing her in death. She's really freaked out. I know how energy works and, um, you know, words are so powerful. So I feel responsible for um, the things that I say because there are a lot of children and not even children, just a lot of people who are very influenced by music. The only thing I've ever wanted to do was help people. You know, there's a lot of sick people in the world, a lot of people who are struggling and suffering and they're just not happy. And I, I used to be one of those people. And I used to wish that my life would end. On April 25th, 2002, Lisa Nicole Lopez dies at the age of 30. A week after the accident with the boy, there's only three days left in the trip and Lisa is driving to get more footage for her cleansed, revitalized film she's making to show the world that she's a changed woman, that she's happy and healthy. She's on her way to a waterfall, literally chasing a waterfall. And sadly, there was another tragic car crash. She dies instantly on impact and she was the only person fatally injured. What's probably more eerie about this whole thing is that there was recorded footage of this because there was the video camera inside the car and Lisa was filming for her documentary and it was just really hard to have actual footage of her dying. 10,000 people attended her funeral and she was never replaced from TLC who still perform as a duo today. The documentary showing the final 27 days of Lopez's life the Last Days of Left Eye premiered at the Atlanta Film Festival in April of 2007. Most of the footage was shot with a handheld camera, often in the form of diary entries filmed by Lopez whilst on a 30-day spiritual retreat in Honduras, like I mentioned. In these entries, she reflected on her personal life and career. A calmer side of her personality was on display, showing interests in numerology and yoga. Lopez was in the process of setting up two educational centers for Honduran children. One was built in an 80 acre plot of land that she called Camp YAC. The other was a center called Creative Castle. In 2003, shortly after Lopez's death, her family started the Lisa Lopez Foundation, a charitable group dedicated to providing neglected and abandoned youth with resources necessary to increase their quality of life. Her spiritual motto was the one that they used for the foundation, energy never dies, it just transforms. Closing off from Lisa's story, I think it's really important to note the way in which, similar to Amy, there was this really, the the way in which the media had a field day with this woman, the same that, way that they did with Amy, they really took the tragedies of their lives and made a show for us as people to onlook and, and gawk at and go, oh my God, how sad. Oh my God, that's tragic or oh my god how pathetic in a way as well and I think that a really important thing I noted between Amy's story and Lisa's story is the similarities in which they were both called crazy and ridiculed like obviously Amy had her issues with drug and alcohol addiction and she was really like she was going through it with her onstage issues and like how she couldn't perform properly and then Lisa had her alcoholism and she was quite violent and she was expressing her rage in a way that was very visible. And I think with Lisa, it's a bit different because obviously she's a black woman. Mm. So it's obviously, it's just, even if she says she just doesn't like something, she's getting labeled as aggressive, yes. which a- which Amy probably could have done the same thing and be like, oh, it's just a diva, which are two very different titles to give. I think the one thing I note about them is the fact just the men like and I I hate saying that men are this you know the way to downfall but I see a lot of similarities between Amy's relationship with Blake and Lisa's relationship with Andre Andre, was I saying Andre yeah like the fact that they almost made jokes about how they were with crazy women and they just kind of got to just go away afterwards they didn't have to really deal with anything they just got to go away while these women tragically died I was taken aback by Lisa's ability to 
at least think she saw her in death or like felt that it was coming. Envision her in death, yeah. Yeah, because I feel like people can do that. I'm a very spiritual person and I maybe she, that child was meant to, I don't, I don't want to say a child was meant to die, but maybe there was something spiritual going on there because as she retells it, it sounds pretty compelling to me, at least. I, I don't want to say a child had to die for it, but like there's something there. It's definitely, there was a very big connection between the death of that child and her own death. And I definitely understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Now, Indy, what do you, we always do this at the end of all these episodes. What do you wish for, I guess, Lisa and Amy? For Amy, I wished that she had, I, 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 I would say probably time and space to be a child. I think a big part of her, you know, downfall into destruction was the fact that she was never afforded time to just like be a kid and be a kid who was obviously very rambunctious and like uh hated authority and like wanted to just rebel and she had that talent and that talent obviously afforded her the ability to go and do really great things and take her it it took her really really far and that's great I think she was the kind of person where she was such a gentle soul and such a, she was also such an empath. Like you can see that in her music. She was, she's someone who felt very, very, very hard. And I think that that this is something that I've noticed is that everyone who uses heroin in particular Mm. feels on a level that just cannot, it it, it, it can't be numbed without that specific substance like you don't take heroin unless you have something that needs to be pushed that's deep deep inside of you and to be just numbed for at least a little bit and I think that she was this kind of person where she was too gentle for the the harsh realities of our world right Mm. she was an angel I honestly there's a lot of saying that she was an angel and she was because she always seemed very out of place. I'm not sure if you got the vibe. She oh, just absolutely. seemed out of place her whole life. Even her aesthetic and her vibe and her music, like not saying that, you know, it was before her time or after her time, because I think everything happens for a reason. She made music and she existed at this time because she was supposed to, but there was definitely like a level of being misunderstood. And I think that, you know, people like Blake took advantage of that and took advantage of her and gave her drugs and yeah. allowed her to, I guess, exist in this like hedonistic way where she wasn't able to really come out of it until someone pulled her out of it and even then like it still wasn't good enough because there was too much to address and too much to unpack and it just felt like there was too much masculine energy in her life to really help her through everything that she was going through and then if we look to Lisa you know I've talked before about how much I love TLC and like I do I really do and I think that the this is a girl group who was phenomenal and really broke down boundaries within specifically the American hip hop scene at the time. I think for her, I wish that she would have been allowed to be angry without being called crazy. And she would have been able to react to things without being automatically called crazy because she was so fucking intelligent. You guys would have heard Mm. through all of the sound bites that I included here, but she was so fucking smart and I think she was in her own way as well, like really misunderstood and she just wanted to be loved. And I think she loved someone who didn't quite know how to love her back. And I think that that can really harm a person. There's also this kind of vibe, right? Of like, you know, when you're constantly being told by everyone around you that you're a particular kind of way, that eventually you just become that person. You become, Mm. it's easier. You become a shell almost. Exactly. It's easier to just give in to what people are saying about you. People said she was crazy. She became crazy. People said she was unstable. She became unstable. People said all of these things about her because they didn't really know all the underlying trauma they didn't know her underlying Mm. abuse they didn't know any of that stuff about her so they just said oh you're crazy babe you're crazy oh you're crazy oh no you're actually fucking crazy yeah and then it became like that's all she was and that does a disservice to someone when they're trying to live their life as authentically as possible and that's what she was trying to do towards the end of her life she was trying to live her life authentically go on the retreats do your cleanses do whatever brings you closer to that spiritual well-being babe and i wish that she was allowed to finish that and and create this new image of lisa lopez that was not left eye as indy mentioned at the start amy is someone who i'm very connected to i've talked about this when i was a kid i tend to idolize a lot of celebrities she was one of them and i just kind of wish that like 
similar to Lisa as well. Like these women were very kind of tailing off what you said. They didn't fit quite inside the box. And I feel like Amy, especially because it's so funny. Lots of people list her as an influence now, like heaps of people, because I guess we're living in a time where music's way more, not that like you weren't allowed to make whatever music you wanted, but I think it's more easier to say that you like more than one genre now. And I think Amy, as you said, came at a time where she was meant to, the universe sent her here. The one thing I think is very vital when it comes to Amy, obviously there's lots of connections. There's the performing that femme that she always kind of did, even though she had that very masculine energy to her a bit, she still was very femme performing with like the eyeliner and the dresses. And I just always liked that. But I think it's the eating disorder I obviously got an eating disorder after she died because I was a bit older when I got it. But like, I don't know, there's something about that in there. But like with Lisa Lopez, especially, I think Lisa Lopez's story to me sounds like the universe sent her here for a reason because people still talk about her death like it's a tragedy because it is, but people still talk about her. And I think she was sent, both these people were sent here to do something. They did it, but then the universe has a sometimes sick joke of, okay, well, you've done what you needed to. Your death is going to really teach everyone else a lesson. And I feel like that's kind of what happened to both of these women. Absolutely. And I feel like Lisa Lopez, her ending, there's something, there's something that's always been weird to me about her death. It just would like, cause I knew about the kid, but like, there's always been something funny about not funny, like ha ha, but just, (laughs) Off. peculiar yeah like off about her death and I've, I'm not saying it was like someone did it I'm not saying that but spiritually with the whole talk of like dark spirits and stuff like that I think it ultimately points in both cases to how horrible the music industry has become that you can ask anyone you can ask Britney especially you can ask Mariah Carey especially who was going to get talked about the music industry at the at the moment is filled with so much dark energy and devil worshipping. And I know I probably sound crazy, but it's a very dark place to be a musician now. And I think these women re- stories really highlight that, especially Lisa Lopez. Like she couldn't even just go away. And like, yes, like she ran away from her commitments, but like shit was fucking happening. And then they just labeled her as crazy. But it's like, I hate to sound like conspiracist, but like the music industry right now is disgustingly horrible to everyone. So that has been Hot Girls Theory. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please rate, review, and subscribe because we love to hear from you. So please email us at hotgirlstheory at gmail.com. You can find me, Ash, on Instagram, Rose and Indy at Fueled by Indy on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> find the pod on Instagram and Twitter at Hot Girls Theory. Bye, Bye. guys.